Hello everyone and welcome to a WIAA Prep Football Playoffs edition of Extra Points. I'm Dan, he's Travis, and Travis, we were all set to um, get to this on Monday, provide an outlook of the five area playoff matchups, and then uh, some litigation in Milwaukee, uh, a co-op there contested that they were eligible for the playoffs, the WIAA said they were not, and that pushed things back Monday night. Finally, some teams found out their matchups. The rest of the teams found out Tuesday. And fortunately, everything's uh, for the moment settled and we're able to get back to paying attention to football. So let's jump right into things. Um, five matchups, like I said, starting in Division Three, where tonight Lodi uh, from the Northern Capital Conference will play at Madison Edgewood at Middleton uh, at Bright Breitenbach Stadium there. That game will start at 7 p.m., for Lodi, they've won three straight first-round playoff games. Last year's in Division Three was against uh, a, a Wisconsin Dells team that Lodi was better than. Two years prior, uh, both years before that was in Division Four. This is Lodi's second straight year playing in Division Three. They have one of the lower enrollments of the 32 teams in that division. Mm -hmm. So in and of itself is a challenge. I don't think that they've played of those last three games, anyone quite like Madison Edgewood, who they have tonight, and, um, and so that'll be a challenge. Edgewood, 7-2 and two for the season. One of their seven wins was in week two against DeForest, 24-20, uh, to 20, very good DeForest team. In week one, Edgewood scored 19 points against Wanakee, the two-time defending Division II state champions. That was the most um, points that Wanakee allowed all season, and in fact, the next closest was 10 in week nine to uh, in a 14-10 win over DeForest. And, um, and Edgewood's, uh, one of Edgewood's other losses was to Monona Grove in week five. In that game, they held Monona Grove to a season low 20, uh, 27 points. And between those three teams, Edgewood uh, has played, uh, I, I'm guessing one of those three teams, Wanakee, DeForest, or Monona Grove, perhaps two even, as Wanakee and Monona Grove are on opposite sides of the Division II bracket, will end up in the state title game. So really a challenging test for Edgewood this season that, that probably has them ready for this game and maybe even a deeper playoff run. Uh, one thing Lodi does have going, though, if they can keep it close, um, Donnie Mankey, their kicker, really gives them a boost. He can provide points from really anywhere inside the other team's 35-yard line. He showed that last week with a 52-yard game-winning field goal mm -hmm. um, to give the Blue Devils a 17-14 win over Poinette. So, so for Lodi, you know, look for them to try and try and shorten the game, control the clock, give their their kicker a chance to to keep it close and maybe win it again late. I'm guessing that the experience for Edgewood against those three top Division II teams is going to pay off in this one and the Crusaders are going to be able to prevail. But I'll be at that game tonight. I'm really looking forward to seeing, um, you know, really probably one of the, the better area area first-round playoff games, Travis. Yeah, it does sound like it's a tough opening draw for Lodi, but we'll see what happens. Um, in a Division Four game on Saturday, uh, Watoma against uh, Montello, Princeton, Green Lake. This will be a 5 p.m. game in Princeton. Uh, this is going to be a fun game, I think. Um, Kind of features two senior quarterbacks, two excellent senior quarterbacks. Uh, Montella, Princeton, Green Lakes, Braden Foss um, is thrown for almost 1,700 yards and 24 touchdowns this year. Obviously big numbers there. But Watoma's got their own gunslinger in Johnny Egan, a senior. He's thrown for uh, over 1,400 yards and 22 touchdowns. The thing with Egan, he's also a rushing threat. He's rushed for over 1,000 yards and 13 touchdowns on the ground. So it's kind of a dual threat guy that's going to really cause some trouble for the uh, for the MPGL defense. Um, but the good news for uh, the Phoenix is they also got Matt Sosinski, who's kind of does everything. He's a big-time receiver, and uh, that kind of gives them another weapon to throw at Watoma. He's uh, scored 20 touchdowns through the air this year and has over 1,000 yards receiving. So he's kind of Braden Foss's uh, main uh, target. And so you look at all these offensive weapons, it so seems like it's going to be a shootout. Very well could be. Um, I think what's going to decide it is I think MPGL – has played improved defense this year. I think that's a big reason that uh, they were in the conference hunt and maybe gets overlooked a little bit because of their offense. Um, they're only giving up 10.9 points per game, while Watoma's giving up over 20 a game. So it appears that uh, MPGL has the better defense, and that's why I think maybe they got a slight edge in this matchup. 
I was out to Princeton um, on, on Wednesday to talk to some of the guys for a story that's going to be in tomorrow's paper. And one thing that um, everyone I talked to said, the key to winning this game is going to be uh, to stop Egan. So you mentioned that improved defense. Mm -hmm. um, they're really going to need, need that defense to step up, like you said, and hopefully for, for MPGL. Um, they've had some nice seasons of late, haven't been able to translate that into deep playoff runs. So mm -hmm. they're looking to get started on the right foot in this yeah. one and, and try and make a deep playoff run for, like you said, a very talented offense that, that yeah. could provide uh, a lot of fun if they're able to keep this thing going. Yeah. Uh, meanwhile, in division, uh, also a Division Four game, for the first time since 1997, mm -hmm. Westfield is in the playoffs. And um, as you might imagine, for a team that finished 4-5, and five, they did not get any favors with their first round match. They play at Omro, so they have to go on the road. Mm -hmm. And Omro is eight and one. And for these two teams, the the you know as you might imagine, eight and one. Omro played. Um, they only lost one game, and they are four and zero against teams that qualified for the playoffs. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, Westfield is zero and four. Right. Um, and Westfield only managed thirty three points in those four losses they allowed more than 150 points. So if Westfield's going to move on and get their first playoff victory since 1987, so 10 years before their last playoff berth, mm -hmm. if Westfield's going to do that and get that first win since 87, they're going to need uh, a considerably better effort mm -hmm. than the four that they showed against similar competition mm -hmm. throughout the regular season. Yeah, yeah that, uh, no doubt the program's moving in the right direction no matter what happens on the weekend here. Uh, moving on to Division 6, Partyville is uh, in the playoffs again. It seems like they're always there. Um, they're going to be playing Hilbert. Um, both or Partyville 6-3 and three overall, while Hilbert 7-2. and two. Um, One thing that's kind of interesting, this Partyville's 12 previous playoff appearances were in Division 5. This is a Division 6 game. Partyville's actually got the largest enrollment of all Division 6 schools. So I think that, I mean, that's not a... A deciding factor, but I think that that could help Partyville. I mean, obviously, uh, they're now playing a little smaller schools. Uh, Hilbert, you might, uh, whenever you look back at uh, all the teams that play at Camp Randall over the years, you probably remember Hilbert being there quite a bit. Um, they have won state championships in uh, 89, 94, and 96, and were runners up four times in 92, 2001, 2002, and 2008. So, this is a program that knows how to win in the playoffs. Well, maybe the kids that are going to be playing this weekend aren't so much part of that, but as a program overall, they know how to get it done, and I think that matters. Um, the, I think the key to this game is Partyville's ground game. If they can get their ground game going, I think uh, they're going to be tough to beat. But uh, in their three losses, they really, that's kind of the key. They struggle to get the ball moving on the ground. So if they can get like around 150 yards rushing, and they're pretty balanced, they can pass, but they, if they get their running game going, I think they got a good shot. You mentioned that enrollment um, factor. Partyville in the past in Division Three, uh, you know, it, it has, like you said, had one of the lower enrollments, and, and they um, came out of the trailways where they felt like maybe they... In um, Division Five, yeah. In Division Five, right. Yeah. Maybe they sometimes weren't prepared for the playoffs. Having that highest enrollment in Division Six, I'll be curious to see if that gives them maybe a little bit of a mental edge mm -hmm. more than anything. Um, at this point in the season, all of the teams really that make the playoffs are, are going to provide a good test, but yeah. um, be curious to see if, if that makes a difference bumping down a division mm -hmm. um, for Partyville. So, and moving on to the final area playoff matchup, right here in Portage on Saturday afternoon, Rio hosts Blackhawk. Mm -hmm. And this game is really a, a matchup of two very similar teams, at least in terms of um, the scope of their season. Rio averaged a little more than 30 points per game, allowed a little less than 13 points per mm -hmm. game. And the numbers were basically the same for Blackhawk. So mm -hmm. you have to think something's going to give in this game. Mm -hmm. um, either it's going to be a low-scoring affair and defenses are going to prevail, or it's going to be a high-scoring affair and um, offenses mm -hmm. are going to prevail. I don't expect one team to um, run away from the other team. But if I had to guess, Ryo has played exceptionally well over the last five weeks of yeah. the season. Um, a very impressive win over Johnson Creek mixed in there, and they've won those five straight to finish the regular season by a little more than 28 points. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't know a whole lot about Blackhawk, but certainly the momentum has built to this point in the season for Rio, 
and they'll be looking to keep that going mm -hmm. and try and come out on top, get to the second round of the playoffs for the second straight year. So there you have it, five area playoff matchups to pay attention to this weekend. Travis, we'll be back next week, and one nice thing, uh, we will not have to wait for anything to happen <laughs> in the courts. We will know the matchups as soon as Saturday night mm -hmm. when all of the games finish. Okay. So yeah. until then, everybody, good luck to all of the area teams, and we will see you again next week. Take care. Thank you.